Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Friday, October 5th, Market Watchers Live show with your host, Tom Bowley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Okay, well, it is a rough day on Wall Street today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down another 260 points. The S&P 500 down 24. The NASDAQ is down about 117 points, another 100 point plus down day on the NASDAQ. The Russell 2000 also taking on the chin down about 23 points today. We've got the 10 year Treasury yield up another four basis points, the 3.24%. Volatility index is soaring. We're going to talk about that in a bit and uh, talk about some levels where we typically will see the VIX kind of die down and the market bottom. Uh, don't know if we're there yet. Doesn't appear to be, uh, or we don't appear to be. Utilities, very surprising. Utilities leading the action along with real estate today, given that the 10-year Treasury yield is higher. But I think it's a, the fact that it's defensive money. And we've got the market on uh, a, pretty, a pretty big move to the downside. So I think we're getting some rotation over into utilities and real estate because of that. Technology, as you can see, getting hit very, very hard. Also, semiconductors. Just a few days ago, we were trying to break out of the trading range. Now, in just three short days, we're all the way back down, uh, flirting with a breakdown of that trading range. Commercial vehicles and trucks also taking on the chin today after threatening a breakout, not getting it the last couple of days. And Caterpillar, as you might imagine, the weakest stock on the Dow because of that uh, weakness in that industry group. Uh, Caterpillar trying now to hold on to its rising 20-day moving average and its recent low around 150. Well, Aaron, happy Friday, first of all. Um, I don't know. How are, how are the ducks doing? I know my capitals took one on the chin. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't play since uh, the Wednesday night, so we'll have to see what happens. I, I believe we have a game tomorrow night, tonight or tomorrow night. I don't really know for sure because all I'm paying attention to is October 8th, which is the first home game. So <laughs> weather's good out here. Let's see. Market, like you said, not so good. Uh, portfolio taking a bit of a hit today. Not liking that. Yeah, I've been stopped out of a number of positions the last few days. Not not a, you know, the, the small caps, which is kind of an area that I've been paying more attention to, really uh, had a horrible September. So it has not been a good five or six weeks. <laughs> sure. Seems like every trade I put on, the, the market just gives me a little bit less money back. Each <laughs> So, uh, but uh, we do have uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal with us today for what's hot and what's not. How are you doing this morning, Mary Ellen? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Are you a uh, hockey fan? You have a hockey team? I'm not. No. I, uh, when my guys were younger, we would get to a, a couple of the Ducks games, mm -hmm. but uh, not much more beyond that. Yeah, well, well, we'll have to change that. I'm going to have to drag <laughs> you to a few. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it growing up. I'll say that. Uh, the Philadelphia Flyers, big, big fans. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, that's the end of that conversation. Yeah, let's end it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have right. you back. Yeah, I was just going to say, we'll have you back here in about 15 minutes or so, Mary Ellen, if that's all Super. right with you. Sounds oh, great. Excellent. So the, this uh, week coming up, we have a uh, earnings spotlight on the 8th, which I believe is a Monday, right? Yes. And we have Tom's workshop, which will be on Tuesday. And then I know that, uh, yes, Bill Shelby will be coming in on Thursday of next week. And although it's not here, I'll tell you, Mary Ellen will be back on Friday too. So today's agenda, what's hot, what's not with Mary Ellen McConaughey. 10 and 10, our first symbol will be Tilly's, T-L-Y-S. And we will finish off the day with my sentiment update. Let you know what sentiment is looking like. Very interesting today. I'll give you that hint. But let's get started with the technical news and headlines. Some very interesting economic reports today. Yes, there were. Of course, we had the monthly non-farm payrolls out for September. And, you know, it was kind of interesting because the ADP employment report, when it came out on Wednesday, everyone's like, okay, it's too hot. Um, and, of course, the market's been selling off since. Well, today, for those who thought the ADP report maybe was too hot, you'd think they, were, they would be pretty happy with today's because it did show growth. The, we had uh, September non-farm payrolls, 134,000, but less than expected, which was 180,000. And so that tepid growth has been fueling the stock market for the last many years. 
but not today. Um, Non-farm payrolls, as I mentioned, did come up short. The uh, private payrolls also came up short, 121,000 versus 175,000. The uh, September unemployment rate, 3.7% versus the anticipated 3.8%. And that 3.7% was the lowest in the last five decades. Uh, and then finally, September average hourly earnings rose three-tenths of 1%, as expected. And the reaction, what the bond market tells us is, uh, well, it's still a hot report. We're still uh, you know, selling bonds, uh, which I think eventually will be good for the market, but we've got to get over this initial shock. Uh, with the volatility spiking. I'll talk about that in just a second. But you can see this breakout clearly now above that 3.11%. If it wasn't confirmed back on Wednesday when we broke out above 311, I think the last two days certainly is there. It is confirming this move to the upside with now the 10 year Treasury yield at 3.24%. Probably not too many folks were thinking that probably six to eight months ago, but uh, we are up 3.24%. Four percent. We have broken that downtrend, in my opinion, the longer term downtrend. So now the question is, how high do we go here on this initial push to the upside? Difficult to say. Uh, we are clearly in an uptrend, though, and I would follow that 20 day moving average, which does tend to uh, be a pretty good uh, support area during uptrends, not just in the 10 year Treasury yield, but also in terms of stocks and ETFs and industries and so forth and indexes. Uh, so let's keep moving here. I want to talk about the volatility index because that is, to me, the big news right now. When you get into one of these selling episodes like we've seen many times before, a lot of times it does come down to the emotional side of trading and the sentiment. And the volatility index is one of those things that kind of shows us many times um, you know, how fearful the market is getting. And when you look across here, this is a two-year chart of the S&P 500 here on the top. And here's a two-year chart of the volatility index. Now, you can see a huge spike in volatility back when the selling occurred in uh, late January, early February. That was a very significant drop. Now, since then, I think the move to the upside has been uh, much more tempered than what we saw in early January when we really just went straight up. So I don't expect that we're going to see the kind of VIX readings that we saw back in February. So instead... If we get past this February, March, April period, when there definitely was a little bit more um, panic in the air, I think when we look at the other pullbacks that we've seen, um, and I'm going to go back over the last couple of years, when we looked at, uh, for instance, April, you can see the volatility index. I'm going to annotate this just to make it a little easier to compare this going across. I put this a similar uh, article or similar chart in my blog article this morning. But we could probably, if we just use closing, and I think that's what I used in my blog article, you'll see that we haven't had closes above 16 to 18 during most of these pullbacks when we get through into profit taking uh, periods. So I'm going to annotate some of these levels here on the VIX. You can see that there was a pretty good pull, um, move up in the VIX back in April of 2017. And that coincided with a little bit of selling there. You could see even in May, we jumped up, almost got into that 16 to 18 level. You can see that coincided with a the bottom there. But just looking at the 16 to 18 level here, you can see we got down. And I think that that might even go, well, we had two tops here on the VIX near 16, the second of which came in on that low. Uh, coming across here in May, once we started resuming the move to the upside, you can see the VIX spiked up into that 1618 range in late May to mark that bottom. Then again, late June to mark that bottom. We saw in early, well, second week of August to mark that bottom. And so now the question is, where does the VIX go here with the market pulling back? What we do know is that these VIX spikes tend to mark bottoms. Uh, maybe not that exact day, but typically pretty close to that. I think we could probably uh, go back here into this August low of 2017 and see we had a couple of bottoms, a couple of tops. But generally speaking, when the volatility gets up to this level, this is when fear is kicking in and that is what normally drives a market bottom. But when the VIX is on the rise, it's really hard to say where the top is going to go. Right now, the VIX is 1636, but we've seen the VIX up at 20 recently, like in the last three to six months. 
And when we see that, we normally see some very panicked selling, some very swift moves to the downside. That's what we saw yesterday. That's what we're seeing today. So trying to determine where to mark this bottom is very difficult. What I'd like to see is a reversing candle if one prints. I think that helps to establish a bottom from a price perspective. And also, a lot of times you'll see these long tails to the upside on the VIX because as the, the market bottoms and rallies off of the lows intraday, we see a pullback off the intraday highs on the VIX. That's why many of these highs, when you look across here, um, result with a long tail to the upside because the VIX kind of gets to a level and then starts settling down. And once it begins to settle down, folks begin buying back into equity. So this is a, you know, an exercise that is worth going through and following from time to time. Whether or not today marks a bottom or whether it's sometime next week, way too early to tell. But when we get these reversing candles on the S&P 500 or we get these long tails to the upside on the VIX, I think at that point, if you've got money on the sidelines, might be worth taking a shot. But until then, we're seeing how fast the market can drop. It always goes down a lot faster than it goes up. That is one thing for sure in the market. Okay, let's take a look at a few industry groups. Uh, and maybe even before I do that, uh, instead of doing that, maybe, uh, let's take a look at the XLI versus the S&P 500. Um, because this is a group that, in my opinion, is beginning to strengthen. And uh, let's go back and just take a look over the last five years on a daily chart. And what you're going to see is um, on these relative charts, a lot of times they act just like a stock chart. So an individual stock chart. So here you can see all of these relative tops on the XLI versus the S&P. And then back in late 2016, we took off. Notice we came right back down during all that uh, weakness that we saw in the first six, seven months of this year. We went down on industrials and tested that relative support line. And now we are moving up and really breaking out right now to a three or four month high. So I'm not going to steal too much of uh, Mary Ellen's thunder. I know she's going to talk a little bit more about some of these uh, industrials being in the what's hot camp. Uh, so I'll let her go through that. But definitely on a relative basis, I think this chart is clearly showing that the industrials are beginning to strengthen or have been strengthening for the fat past few weeks. And when the Treasury yields are on the rise, a lot of times it is the industrials and even the uh, financials that tend to uh, perform well. So we got a number of upgrades, downgrades, so I will turn it over to Aaron. What do you have in terms of upgrades and downgrades? Oops, sorry about that. Let me get right to this here, try and share. I do have quite a few upgrades and downgrades. Let's go ahead and take a peek here. I'll get to the... Wow, hard to get maneuvering here today. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. We have uh, five downgrades and three upgrades. I'm going to go ahead and start with those downgrades for you. All right, B, uh, B let's see, COM, <laughs> C-O-M-M. -M. Nomura downgraded this from a buy to a neutral. I have annotated these charts, so I do want to give you an opportunity to see what we're, we're looking at here. Uh, at this point, COM, you know, we do look for bottom fishing opportunities uh, when we go through these downgrades. This one, not, not so. And what I wanted to do today with a little bit of the, uh, with these downgrades, uh, I wanted to show you where we had some notice that things were going wrong uh, because we did have notice. We had this breakdown from that rising bottoms trend channel. We got the 20, 50 day EMA negative crossover. We had a PMO sell signal. All of this happened a lot earlier than this downgrade. So I would look for it to continue lower. This is an area of support, certainly. But I would say looking at this PMO still and, and right now accelerating downward, uh, look at the OBV. Nothing's looking uh, really uh, interesting for Comscope. Uh, Eastman Chemical, JP Morgan downgraded this from an overweight to a neutral. And investors uh, are are piling it on here as far as selling. So we've now hit this area at $92, uh, which I've marked where we closed back here 
because we did have that big tail over here I didn't want to include. And you can tell how it goes and, and meets the touching with this uh, October high. So I think that's a pretty legitimate area of support. And right now you can see we're starting to, to trade below it. Uh, so I would look for a drop further down here to that $85 range. So not looking good for Eastman Chemical. I can see the, why they downgraded. UBS downgraded High Crush Partners from a buy to a neutral. Again, another one with the big breakdown. Notice with this one where we got the original PMO sell signal. I didn't count this because if you look in the thumbnail, it was just a little noisy uh, whipsaw. But we had notice all the way back here with the PMO in mid-August. And then we had that 20, 50 day negative crossover. You can see it never quite got the buy signal and came down as far as the 2050. So again, we had some warning that things were gonna go uh, south. Uh, really, this was mostly sideways trading and that's the kind of trading I don't like to be involved in anyway. Uh, so that one, I don't see that as a, a good bottom fish opportunity. All right, HP Incorporated, we can see uh, was downgraded by JP Morgan from an overweight to a neutral. This one actually looked in, looks interesting to me. Uh, we've been in a rising trend channel. We're now breaking down from it, but of course we did get a downgrade today by JP Morgan. But we have some support uh, lingering up here. We still have a rising trend that we could uh, continue. We would have to have a drop down to that 50 day EMA. So that could be a little painful, but I think this one will be uh, worth watching. Uh, this is also a really strong area of support that I see back here as well. So I would consider it for a watch list. You can see OBV volume is sort of increasing here on, uh, but it was increasing on an, an uptrend. So uh, at this point, I think that this chart uh, should go to the watch list. It's pulling back. We might have an opportunity here later. Mylan downgraded from uh, by Mizuho from a buy to a neutral. And as you can see, another difficult decline. This one, however, is starting to sit on some very important support. Look at these touches back here from May, August, uh, November. And so this is really a great opportunity, I think, uh, if we can get a bounce off of this. But like I said, here's your PMO cell signal that warned us of this decline, as well as that 20, 50 day EMA negative crossover, which confirmed that signal. So we had some warning. We're now getting down toward very important support. The PMO is accelerating downward. So be careful with that. But I, I think this one has some opportunity and let's look at it on a weekly chart very quickly. This is very important support, but we have to be aware and alert to the fact that at $30, you know, we could see that move to test these lows down here. And you can see the weekly PMO is top below its signal line. So always worth a look at those weekly charts. BJ's Restaurants, we're now looking at upgrades. And as you can see, uh, we have a nice rising trend here on BJ's. Uh, the Piper Jap Free uh, upgraded from a neutral to overweight. So I would start looking, you know, we got that move down below uh, that broke that rising trend, but briefly, and now we're starting to head right back up above it. Currently trading below, but uh, you know, I think if we can get back up above and continue, uh, you know, close above this rising bottoms line, I think there's some opportunity here. Could see an oversold PMO. Uh, watch to see uh, it it turn over, uh, turn back up over the zero line. Uh, so another watch list candidate and on an upgrade, certainly interesting. Eli Lilly having a fantastic uh, week so far, as we can see. Uh, Eli Lilly, BMO Capital, upgraded from a perform to an outperform, uh, looking good, got the gap up. I think this one has all of the technicals I like to see on a breakout. Uh, you're getting a little bit of, I wouldn't say a pullback because we are still up 1.37%, uh, but we're having a pause at least if you look at the intraday highs, uh, we haven't gotten above that. So I think this is gonna be a great opportunity. Look at that PMO uh, undulating bottom that goes right up and crosses above that signal line. That's, I love seeing these um, crossovers, very clean crossovers. They're usually a lot more accurate when you get a clean crossover. And this one looks pretty darn good. 
All right, Quinn Street upgraded by William Blair, initiated with an outperform. So they initiated this already on the top side here. We've got a PMO getting ready to give us a buy signal. We've got the breakout up here, uh, tested that overhead resistance today, pulled back. We are trading in the bottom of the range today. So we got a breakout and a pullback all in one day is how I kind of look at it. You've got a uh, rising bottoms trend line, which looks pretty good here. I'd like to see a close above the 50 day EMA. To me, that would confirm that breakout because we haven't had even the breakout above the 20. And you know, we're now getting that plus we're above the 50. So I'd like to see it on a big breakout like this hold above the 50. And that's all I have for upgrades and downgrades. Let's bring in Mary Ellen. Are you all ready? What's hot and what's not? Hi, yes, I'm here and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Lots to go ahead and cover today. And what I'd like to do is go ahead and start out, of course, with what's hot. We're in a very difficult period, certainly over the last couple of days, last week in the markets here, but there are actually bright spots out there so we can go ahead and take a look at some of those. I'm going to go ahead and start out with energy stocks. And this is XLE, the energy sector chart. So you can visibly see that we've been in a period over the last couple of weeks, at least here in a rally mode. And that has everything to do with the price of oil. We've seen oil spike quite a bit, depending on whether you look at the uh, crude or Brent oil. Uh, we've seen new highs, certainly four-year highs in the price of oil. So within this, I will tell you that interestingly that Russia and Saudi Arabia did have a quiet agreement to go ahead and increase oil production. And that news came out yesterday. But despite the news, oil stocks and uh, energy related are still performing quite well. What I wanted to do is take a moment because when we look at these oil related stocks, it's important to keep in mind that there are underlying sub industry groups within energy and not all of them are going to respond positively to that oil price rise. So what I've done here, this is candle glance, uh, using stock charts, of course. And I've gone ahead and input the four sub industry groups. And I've overlaid an RSI indicator looking for relative strength among these sub groupings. It's in descending order. And this first one is the US oil fund, and that is the strongest. So we're going from strength to weakness. But let's take a look here. Uh, DJUSOS, that is the US exploration and production. And as a note, these guys are going to have a very direct benefit from an increase in oil. These are the guys that are out there uh, finding the oil and then producing it. So the per barrel price is going to very positively impact them. Next, we have DJUSOL. These are the integrated oil and gas, and these are the secondary as far as those in line to benefit. The integrated, these companies provide services in all areas, but they do have work in the way of production as well. And then the DJSOI over here, these are the equipment and service uh, guys within oil. So you can see that they're rallying. It's just not quite as strongly. What these uh, the effect is going to be is the increase in oil is going to go ahead and increase the output that these E&P guys are going to do. And at some point, it will drill down into these equipment guys because they will have more demand for the equipment and services that these guys offer. So these guys will come on. It's just going to be a lagging effect. And then the last one, the DJ USPL, these are the pipelines. There have been uh, pipeline issues as far as uh, back backups and not enough in the way of pipelines, but you can see that these guys are laggards. So for the most part, uh, you are better served to be fishing in the E&P space. You can see the direct benefit that they're experiencing. So let's go ahead, drill down and take a look at a couple of stocks within that 
ENP space. And the first name I'm going to be pulling up is EOG. And this uh, particular company has huge growth prospects. So you can see that this stock has been rallying in line with that XLE group graph. It is poised to break out of a base. I like to look at saucer bases. So you can see going back to August, we're looking at a two plus month base that this EOG is poised to break out of. The company is expected to earn 400% greater than 2017. And for 2019, the growth prospects, they're looking for 26% in earnings. And analysts are continuing to rise and increase their earnings estimates for this company because of that increased oil pricing. And what the other primary driver here is within the oil production space, U.S has sanctions against Iran. So we're not getting output from Iran and the impact there has been greater than analysts anticipated. So we're seeing reduced production and continued demand for oil. So, so hence the price is going up. And there is actually a price target out there of 148 for this stock. It's trading at 130 right now. And the company stated that they can grow at a 20% rate till 2020 if energy is in the $50 per barrel. And right now, energy is well over $70. So they are well-based to continue to grow. Let's take a look at another one in that space. APC is the ticker symbol. This is Anadarko. And this particular company has a nice yield, 1.5% yield. You can see that this turnaround in the stock is just beginning. We have that positive RSI. And then let's take a look at the MACD down here. MACD is just coming up above that net neutral in a positive fashion. And this particular company, it's a turnaround. They did not make money, but this year they are on track explosive growth relative to last year. Next year, they're looking for 35% earnings growth. And the company just locked up 100,000 more acreage in what's called the Wyoming Basin. This is a very uh, lucrative area right now. And the 2019 prospects for drilling in the area are apt exceptional. So there's another company that also has a price target of 77. It's trading at about 69 right now. And let's go ahead and take a look at one last stock in the energy space. And this is one of those integrated companies that provide services in many areas, but they do also have oil production. And uh, this is Marathon Oil. You can see that this one of the three is the most positively poised as far as being in a very confirmed uptrend. It broke out. It was one of the first stocks to break out. And I will tell you, when you're looking at moves into industry groups, into sectors, you want to pay attention to those stocks that are first out of the gate, so to speak. So we can see that this stock broke out of a very, very long base, taking us back to the beginning of September, and it's continuing. Those stocks that break out initially do go on to become your leadership stocks, and they will I generally continue to outpace the broader markets. And this is another one they're expecting to grow production by 25 to 30% in 2018. And they are doing a lot in the way of reconstructing they have over the last two years. The company has very low debt. They're selling off non-performing assets. So the growth expectations are, remain quite high. So we can move on now out of energy. Let's take a look at industrials. And Tom uh, was pointing out the move into industrials, the firming up of that group. But I will tell you within the industrials, there are areas and pockets of strength. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the industrial sector. And this is a one week view and we can see that aerospace holds up really quite well as does defense stocks. And a lot of that has to do with 
uh, Trump in August, he okayed a seven, uh, $717 billion defense budget for 2019. That's a record high. Uh, Trump is adamant about improving homeland security. And what he's doing is reversing uh, a lot of the recent decisions over the years to reduce military power. He's putting that up at the forefront. So we can take a look at a couple of stocks that are benefiting from that. And here we're looking at Boeing, and you can see that the stock is currently pretty much ignoring what's going on in the markets around uh, as far as the severe distribution that we've been seeing. But this stock is very much in an uptrend, finding support at that upward trending. I like to use simple moving average. That's this 10 day or green line. Your RSI is positive, a little bit over sold, uh, overbought, but still holding firm. And down here we have the MACD, which is also quite positive. Boeing's growth prospects are very, very strong, uh, not only within aerospace and defense, but also outside as far as their uh, airplane, uh, they continue to win contracts in that space. Another name we can take a look at, this is a smaller stock within this defense area. It's Document DCO. The company is about 400 million in market cap. And this particular stock, we can see it had a big gap up here back in August. Let's see if I can drill down here. And this was an very, very strong earnings report. The company gapped up and we can see that subsequent to that, the stock is pretty much digesting this big move, but it is holding in really quite firmly. And the stock on this earnings release jumped 18%. So we can see that this is again, just simply digesting that with an anticipation for another leg up. This company continues to beat earnings estimates. It is a turnaround story. They lost money last year, put in a new CEO who's had a lot in the way of initiatives. They're acquiring outside companies and they're currently winning a number of contracts. So the growth trust Prospects look really quite good, and they are on track to grow earnings by 126% next year. So certainly this would be one to have on your radar screen. And let's go ahead one uh, other area that is holding up well. I know that Tom mentioned Caterpillar is taking a little bit of a hit today with those trucking, but this is in the uh, construction equipment area. And actually it is starting to break down, but there were some analyst notations over the last couple of weeks. One analyst put a price target of 208 on this stock. It's currently now at 152. And uh, the notes were that the global mining equipment has a 25% replacement upside, which is bullish, but we'll keep an eye on this one uh, as it is getting hit. Uh, what you'll want to do is keep an eye on the volume characteristics as a stock breaks key simple moving averages. If it occurs on high volume, that's going to be a little bit more negative. Uh, Deer is another one in the uh, this particular stock. Let's see if we can pull it up. Uh, Deer is in the agricultural space. That's where it is uh, classified. And as such, it did get hit with those tariff fears because agricultural companies, of course, would be very heavily impacted. We can see more recently that it has been rallying. And when you drill down and look at this company, uh, management says that the, the demand for their products is going to outpace any tariff possibilities. And then also, when you drill down, a lot of their revenue is from forest forestry products. It's not their agricultural side where they're seeing growth. So there's an anticipation that demand for those products is going to soar. And so also another company that has a price target from Wall Street firms of 193 and the stock currently trades at 155. So those are your bright spots. I did want to make sure and get to those that are not working, but very quickly wanted to mention that some of these large cap growth stocks are holding in 
quite well. There are a number of them, and each one of these stocks has a firm reason for why. Verizon, they're trimming their workforce by 3%. They're looking to cut $10 billion in uh, cost. And they're also rolling out, they just rolled out their first commercial 5G network, super fast Wi-Fi, so we can see Verizon. And I know that Aaron talked about Lilly, and you can see this. This gap up here is in response to positive trial results for their diabetes product. So you can see it's when you see stocks that are withstanding downside pressure in the broader markets that's super bullish in the sense that once the broader market pressures are off, this stock should continue to rally higher. Another big name is Pfizer, PFE. They just had last week, uh, their lung cancer drug was approved. And one last large cap that's a bright spot in holding in well, this is Disney DIS. The company announced that they're going to be offering live streaming services. So that's it on the plus side. We have to take a moment here and look at areas that are not so hot. And of course, technology is going to come to mind immediately. And we can look at the technology sector and you'll see that this particular area is not working, but let's take a look quickly at the NASDAQ, the tech heavy NASDAQ, and you can see that the NASDAQ is breaking down. This is a daily chart. And what I wanted to point out here, let's go ahead and update this. Uh, this is the further deterioration. What you want to pay attention to, I like to use stochastics when looking at broader market indices. This break below this dashed net neutral is quite negative. You can see the breakdown there. And this turnaround is what you are going to want to see. So at some point with an anticipation that the NASDAQ gets oversold, this type of break back up is going to be your signal that we have bottomed. So I would add stochastics when you're looking at the broader markets. But take a look. We're going to review some of these stocks within the technology area that are really getting hit quite hard. And one is the computer software stocks. And this is an area that has been super strong going into the close last week. The sub-industry groupings within software were up over 40%. They were absolutely the leading industry group in technology and actually in the broader markets. So we're looking here at technology. Take a look at software stocks this week. They are getting hit the hardest down 3.7%. And Tom, I think we were going to review some of the names in here and kind of ponder whether we are pulling back or are we seeing something a bit more? Yeah, I, you know, we talked about this a little bit before the show. And, um, you know, when you look at software and I mean, you, I don't know if you can pull up a weekly chart on the DJ USSW, but, you know, we've been looking at over the last year or two, this steady move up in software stocks. And each time we get a pullback in software, it's been holding that rising 20 week moving average. And so when you look at software, I mean, there's probably a lot of folks listening to the show who have been afraid to get into software because we've had this huge move to the upside without much of a pullback. And now we get the pullback and then you're too afraid to jump in. I mean, you know, we got volatility jumping up. These stocks are going through one support level after another. So I guess maybe the big question is, yeah, this is a daily chart. I don't know if you could maybe put oh, that in the weekly bet. and then just go back like the last three years. Um, but yeah, I mean, when, when you look at the weekly chart, I mean, there you can see the 20 week moving average. Now you've got it, actually you've got a 10 week moving average, but you can trust me on this one. We've been holding, I don't think we've had a 20 week close, um, or a, a close beneath that 20 week EMA since probably back in 2016 or maybe, maybe early 2017. Um, but there you, yeah, there you got the 20. Yeah. I mean, take a look at that. So each time we've had pullbacks on software, if you look back to January or February, March, um, or even back into December of 2017, uh, late 2016, every time we've hit that 20-week moving average, it's been time 
to buy. We're not there yet. But my question is, if this group is weakening, is this an opportunity to jump into them? Is it an opportunity to jump into just some of the elite, in your opinion? Or how do you, how do you treat this when you've got such a strong group over the past year or two, when they finally pull back, where do you look or, or do you look at all? For yeah, no, this is, uh, that's actually a super good question. This is a lot of the work that I do. So those that uh, subscribe to my work, we've gone in and out of these computer software stocks. And there were two pullbacks in the summer periods, June and July, you can pull up a daily. And both of those times, it was trade tariff fears. It had a lot to do with the products that these software companies need to upgrade their systems. Uh, they are being heavily tariffed. And so let's take a look here. This is the June pullback. And then we did have one in August that was not quite as severe, although, uh, and I will tell you that during both of those periods, we held on to most of our software stocks. The fundamental dynamics were just too strong to ignore. And so uh, for the most part, we stuck with most of our stocks. Those that really broke below key support on any kind of volume, we uh, discarded, if you will. This is an example of one uh, that broke that 50-day big volume. This is Shopify. It's a retail-based uh, software company, and you can see this break. So, But outside of that, we have a number of these more blue chip, if you will, software. This is Salesforce, CRM. So this stock pulled back in line. It did not pull back as much in July. When you see a stock that does not pull back as much as the particular group, that is signaling the stock as a leadership name. Again, when those pressures come off, it will rally stronger. So we've kept with some of these bigger bellwether type of stocks. I know, Tom, we talked briefly about Adobe, uh, had a brief undercut. But I will tell you, this, this period does feel a bit different. We're getting a lot more in the way of volume, a lot more in the way of stocks that are breaking below key support. So I use those moving averages. This is Paycom, P-A-Y-C, uh, a real leader, because you can see this big gap up here on earnings. And the company is just falling right out of bed. You're getting a lot in the way of volume. So I'm not saying that they will not come back. But what I am saying is what appears to be a bit different this time is the need to uh, exit the stocks. Here's Spotify. This is another one that pulled back more than the markets. And we took it off uh, so breaks below the 50-day simple moving average on big volume are my signal for exits. And you can put your money potentially to work elsewhere, but at least stem your losses. Uh, let's take a look at TYL is another software stock. This is Tyler Technologies. You can see the break below that 50 and uh, on significant volume. So really it's going to be a case by case basis because as you stated and noted we do have some of the uh, larger bellwether stocks if you will that are holding in this is microsoft it's getting hit a little but not quite as much and those are names that you could theoretically stay with with an eye toward a resumption Again, the dynamics within software are there. The numbers, the demand, particularly for cloud-based software, remains very robust. So certainly with an eye toward these groups coming, these names coming back into favor. Tom, do you, how do you feel about that? Um, well, I mean, I like the big names. I mean, certainly Microsoft, um, Adobe, like you mentioned, uh, Salesforce.com. I mean, the way I look at it is I, I agree with you. I think the names that hold up the best when you see the selling are generally going to be the companies that bounce back the best when the group sees some rotation back in. Because those who are looking to get into software are going to be looking to the leaders. Uh, they're not going to be, at least many of the professional managers are not necessarily going to be trying to find bottoms on some of these stocks that have broken down. So I agree with you. I think that some of the big names that you've pointed out certainly look much better to me and a little safer 
Um, I'm not saying that some of these others, I know one that you and I mentioned before the show was Viva, um, V-E-E-V, which is starting to get hit a little bit harder, but they just, they had a, a blowout quarter last time. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at this as a, as a company that maybe ran out of a little juice that had run from $75 to 110 in two months mm-hmm. and probably needed a little bit more pullback just because of, you know, maybe some profit taking. But this is one that has been getting hit a little harder than some of those leaders that I would still keep on my radar. And if I get some kind of reversing candle, something like that, this is one I think that could quickly move back to the top. And the reason I say that is that up until just a week or so ago, this was still one of the leading stocks in software. You're yeah. right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. This is one that held in. It's only been super recently that it's getting hit while many of the other software stocks were beginning to deteriorate prior. This is a stock that uh, we used to have on our list at Folio. They do cloud computing, cloud software for the re- uh, real estate industry. And uh, this one started breaking down well before certainly some of the others. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple of questions uh, that were in the room. One was, um, uh, do you ever, do you hold stocks into their earnings? Because I don't. And I know mm-hmm. you're, you know, you have, you have your ins and outs in many of these stocks. Does does, if a stock looks good, do you hold it into earnings? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to initiate a position right before earnings, but if I own a stock, the fundamentals are there. There actually are tips to knowing and putting the, tipping the odds in your favor as far as whether that company is going to report ahead of estimates. And one of them is if you see analyst raising estimates going into earnings, and it can be as much as four weeks out. But that's proven to be really a a bullish signal. But of course, with that in mind, uh, a lot of stocks, certainly this most recent quarter, uh, a lot of stocks rallied into earnings so that when even if they reported ahead, they were not as handsomely rewarded. You do want to pay attention to that, of course. But uh, yes. And so Viva, a number of these stocks that we've been looking at have been on the uh, suggested holdings list for my newsletter and people have been handsomely rewarded because they've gone up 18%, 13 12%. So uh, not afraid of holding it into earnings, particularly if the analysts are raising as you go into their report. Okay. Uh, another question that come in, and this is maybe uh, one that we all kind of do because we are momentum traders, but why do you recommend stocks after they've had a big run up? And I just know personally for me, it, when a stock's had a big run up, it's because analysts have been out talking to the company. They feel good about the company. They're going back. They're recommending it in their firm. And it's a stock that's outperforming. And I think studies, for the most part, have shown that companies that outperform uh, many times continue to outperform. So mm-hmm. you know, stocks six months ago that, that we might suggest that have been that have broken out uh, many times will continue. And I think, you know, some of the software stocks that you pointed out earlier, Mary Ellen, uh, CRM, Salesforce.com, Microsoft, mm-hmm. Adobe, mm-hmm. Viva Systems. I mean, many of these companies, it's not just a recent run-up that they've had. They've been running up with software and even outperforming their peers for many, many quarters. Yeah. Um, for instance, here's a stock that's been on, on my suggested holdings list for two years now. We're up 250% on this stock. Uh, we picked it up back here. And anytime you see these big gaps up its earnings. These are all earnings reports. So what happens is these companies will report earnings and they will catch the eye of analysts. And then as you're stating, they will meet with management, examine it and continue to revise estimates higher, which will give the stock continued momentum. And uh, a lot of my time as far as learning about equities was working directly with Bill O'Neill and he's done so much in the way of studies. And one of his, uh, if he were to see a stock that were to rally 20% over a one to two week period, that would definitely get on his radar. That's a stock that's going to continue to go up. So there are a lot of nuances, a lot of rules like that, but it all pretends to strength begetting strength. So yeah, good point. Uh, one final question, and uh, I kind of add a little, um, I don't know, a little bit to the question. But back in June, 
if you look at the Russell 2000 relative to the S&P 500, we topped. And since June, we have been declining in terms of small caps relative to the larger caps on the S&P 500. So the question that came in was, what is your view on the small caps? We've seen, especially since the beginning of September, a pretty big slide here on mm -hmm. a relative basis in the small caps. And I know a number of these software stocks that are getting hit, many of them are small caps. What, what's your view on that area of the market? Yeah, that's actually a super good question because let's take a look at this distribution here. Certainly over the last few days, I'll start there. If you look at the Russell 2000 and take a look at how the Russell is broken down by industry groups and by sectors, by far the largest is financials. It is these small banks, these small SNLs. It accounts for 25% of the Russell. And I'm pointing that out because financials this week are rallying. We're seeing a, a push up in these financials. And even that is not helping to stem the distribution in the Russell. So taking a look at the Russell, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, by and large, small cap stocks are far more volatile, certainly than their larger cap peers. So when we see the Russell performing well, that is an indication that the investors have confidence in the markets. They're, they, they're okay with the risk that's inherent in these smaller cap stocks. They're fine with uh, going into these stocks despite the risk, again, a sign of confidence. So this recent sell-off is indicative of another area that is highly uh, volatile is these biotechs. Take a look at how hard they're getting hit this week. That's another area that when they're doing well, it is investor confidence because the risk factor there is, is quite uh, big. But the other thing too, it's interesting to me is the small cap stocks generally outperform and do well in a rising interest rate environment. There've been lots of studies done. And so the fact that these stocks are getting hit despite uh, uptick in yields and in interest rates is another factor. So uh, it's not good that these small cap stocks are not uh, performing well overall. It's, it's not a good sign. Yeah, and I know, uh, you know I, I follow a lot the 10-year uh, treasury yield here in the U.S. versus the uh, German uh, treasury yield because as the U.S. rates rise faster, it's generally of a, a sign of a stronger economy, which in turn leads to a higher dollar. And a higher dollar, in turn, leads to money rotating out of those multinational companies on the S&P that, that suffer uh, these uh, uh, foreign currency translation losses during periods of the rising dollar. Mm. And we haven't really seen, even though the U.S. Treasury yields continue to rise much faster than we see other parts of the world, we haven't really seen the small caps outperforming, even though the dollar has begun to strengthen again. So... It's an interesting question and one that I really at this point don't have an answer for because uh, I have been expecting the dollar to continue to, to strengthen, which should, in theory anyway, send some of that money rotating back over to small caps. But we certainly are not seeing that just yet. True. Okay. There is your summary slide. Always great to have you on here uh, You know, to talk about some of the, the areas of the market that are working, some that aren't. And sure. just from week to week, we do see a lot of shifts. It's hard to say. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts on what you might be talking about next week. Do you, when, well, when, you, uh, when you look at a group that's really strong this week, do you think it's going to continue in the next week or are you looking elsewhere? No, I, I look for a continuation of that strength and uh, given depending on the underlying dynamics. And I've been actually super surprised. This has been going on for five, six weeks now, uh, this, this in and out of these various industry groups. It's its a, a volatility, if you will, that has not been inherent in the market, certainly during the summer months. So uh, we are seeing a bit more back and fill. I didn't really get a chance to talk about financials, but uh, the move into that space is very, very weak. It doesn't look to have a lot in the way of legs. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps talk about that. And then uh, the real decimation has been in these consumer cyclical stocks. They're getting hammered. Uh, apparel guys down five percent cyclicals overall the group is down uh, almost four percent so that's yeah, many, many of these groups that are struggling right now have been struggling during this move have been the groups that have been leading throughout 2018 i mean you, you bet you bet yeah but uh but i yeah there's a lot going on tariff 
related. I was wondering when that uh, cement boot was going to drop because these retailers, uh, many of them import goods from China. So why it's impact being impacted this week, uh, because in August there were Senate hearings, 450 hours of Senate hearings from U.S. Uh, retailers and manufacturers that were just all but crying about the tariffs are going to close their businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so now suddenly here we are six weeks later and it's it the uh, hammer is coming down, so to speak. Yep. Well, it is always a pleasure to have you on here. I know, uh, you know, you did share a lot of different areas of the market that uh, not only are hot, but also not so hot. Yep. And, uh, we look forward to having you back next week to go over it all. Okay, again. great. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate it, Mary Ellen. You bet. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, it is uh, pretty amazing from week to week. I mean, some of them do continue. You know, we've talked about uh, some of the energy names and so forth. And we've been talking about that, Aaron, on the show, how mm -hmm. you know, some of these different areas of the market have definitely, um, you know, kind of changed colors here over the past couple of weeks, couple of months. And some of the big cap NASDAQ names that were leading in the market was really a lot of folks were concerned because it was more of a narrow rally. Some of these really high, large cap uh, stocks that have been going up for weeks and weeks and weeks on end, those are the ones that are, many of them are getting hit a little bit along with the small caps. And we're seeing that money rotate. Some of it is rotating and still holding up the market, like uh, Mary Ellen had pointed out with the industrials and energy and so forth. So yeah. always a good segment. Oh, yeah. It's great to have her on every week because we do get to be, you know, kept up to date on all of that information. And I, you know, I follow sector rotation a lot as well as you. So mm -hmm. excellent information. I do have her website uh, up on the screen. I believe I am sharing that. Uh, so if you go to meminvestmentresearch.com, that's where you'll find her newsletter and more information. So I thought I'd share that because someone in the chat room was asking. All right, but 10 and 10 time. It is. It is. Uh, here is the RRG that I have. Uh, tie right now between cyclicals, healthcare, and technology. And a pretty interesting chart. We have a lot of outliers here, so we may be looking at some of those. But our first one is going to be Tilly's, T-L-Y-S. All right. Let's take a look at Tilly's. I got to tell you, I owned it, and I got stopped out. One of the many that I got stopped out on recently. <laughs> Uh, I chuckle, but I probably shouldn't be chuckling. Um, yeah, it's not been a good uh, last four or five weeks, six weeks for sure. Uh, Tilly's had gapped up with earnings. Very, very strong move to the upside uh, from 18. Actually, might have been 1790 up to 25 and change. Came back down. I really looked at this stock 1819. I thought it was really good support. I expected it to hold. But when the market starts selling off like it has the past couple of days, uh, sometimes, you know, technical analysis can be thrown out the window when the market is just selling off in some of these groups. And I think that is the case right now with Tilly's. I think eventually this could, um, you know, maybe form a bottom and start to rally again. But now that it is down where it is, I don't see any major support until we probably get down below $16. So I'm going to just annotate one more level here that perhaps we can kind of watch. But we did have the prior highs here you can see coming across at about 1575 before we made this breakout in uh, the second week of August. Sideways consolidated, then broke out. The problem is once you start losing support levels, it's one right after the other. And so for me, when I break down below a support area, I don't like to hold and see if we go if we hold the next one because you know $18 down to 1575 is another what 13%. And uh, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of holding on to see if, it, if the next one holds. Uh, you can see that the PPO also turned negative, uh, went below the zero line. So I think at this point I need to see a reversing candle. I need to see something that suggests a bottom is in before I could get bullish again on Tilly's. But, uh, you know, would I be shocked if this thing reversed and started heading back up, heading into its next earnings report? No, not after what we just saw in the last two earnings reports, which were both very positive. So. I think, uh, as Mary Ellen was saying earlier, I think some of these companies, I don't know if Tilly's is one that is impacted by the whole tariff thing, but uh, there's definitely something going on with this group that's not good. And some of these smaller companies are getting hit harder than uh, the average companies within, the, within this space. So I think we just have to be careful here with, this, with Tilly's in, in particular. 
All right. The most popular in the chat room, we actually have a tie, so we'll be looking at both of them. Uh, Roku is the first. Yeah, Roku is one that I'm kind of keeping an eye on. Uh, we did have a negative divergence, so I think we have a sh pretty good chance we're going to see the 50-day moving average coming up. Uh, but if I just annotate here, you'll see as we went up, each time we went up here, you can see we, we moved to new highs on the PPO. But over here, when we hit that high at the beginning of October, you can see that the prices were higher, but the PPO was not. PPO has actually rolled over and started to turn down. So I think the selling is kicking in here. I think Broku is a, an exceptional company, uh, been performing extremely well. I know uh, many of their estimates have been revised, price targets revised higher, but every company gets to a point where it just needs a break. And I think we're there here on Roku. So I would be watching the price support, which it is just now approaching. And then also when I get negative divergences, I look down to that 50-day uh, moving average and the PPO center line is kind of an area where we reset and kind of maybe uh, can begin to start to repair the short-term weakness and start to move higher again. So I think we're getting close here on Roku. It was $78 just a week or so ago. I think the closer you get to 60, the better I like it here. Okay. And the other one that was uh, in the most popular category, PayPal. Yeah, PayPal um, is struggling relative to, uh, say, Square. Uh, this one is broken down. I think Square just set a high maybe five days ago and has pulled back a little bit. Here, PayPal has pulled back quite a bit more, and you can see the volume has picked up on the selling. The 20 is crossing now below the 50, which we haven't seen for a while. I think you got to wait and at least see this stock climb back up through that 20-day moving average or print a major bottom. And when I say a major bottom, I'm going to look at some of these support levels. But the last two key areas of support right in here, if we put a tail in intraday down to about 78 and then close back up above 80, that would maybe give me uh, reason to think that we'd put in a bottom and maybe could trade it in the short term. But unless I see something like that, I'd rather let the stock consolidate, let that 20 day move down and see if we can get back through the 20. Until then, I'd be careful here. Okay. Uh, the next one, let's look at uh, Cara Therapeutics, C A R A. Okay. Cara weakening. Uh, it is in that space. I think this is a biotech, isn't it? I think. Let me uh, it. Yes. Yeah, so it's in that biotech space. It actually has been outperforming, just recently broke to a new high. I think part of the problem with the selling here is not so much with the individual stock because you got a pretty good stock here. It's that the overall group has been pulling back, as uh, I think uh, Mary Ellen mentioned in her what's not area. Uh, biotech's really struggling this past week, and you can see Kara going down with it and on a relative basis going down, although its overall um, relative strength is still intact as far as I'm concerned. So a couple of things I'd look for here. Let's annotate. Uh, I would be watching uh, a trend line. So I think if you come in here and take a look at the recent lows coming across here, something like that. And then also there was that recent breakout and gap support right there. So I'm going to say 1960 to maybe around $20 is an area where I would hope that this is the stock reverses. Uh, I, if I was in it, I'd keep a fairly tight stop because, again, as the volatility index moves higher, many of these companies, when they sell off, it's almost like there's n all of a sudden no buyers out there and the stock's just free fall. So I want to make sure I keep my stops in play. But this is an area I'd look for a reversal. OK, excellent. Uh, next one. I think you've heard of it. Uh, Netflix. Yeah, I think I've heard of this one once or twice. Uh, I wrote a little bit about the specialty retailers trying to come up. Uh, oh, that's, actually, this one has been moved over. Never mind. Uh, Netflix here, um, sideways consolidating. It has broken down out of that short-term uh, rising lows that we had. Nice little trend there. So I would be watching now the recent price low. So let's go back here and take a look. This uh, recent low right there. And then there was also reaction here. I'm going to say between 300 and about 315. I wouldn't be surprised if Netflix falls into that if this selling continues. We do have a little short-term support at 340. That's going to be important. If we fail to hold that, we could see Netflix picking up uh, in terms of selling uh, acceleration to the downside. All right. Uh, let's look at uh, Fitbit. Fit. 
is the symbol. Yep. All right, fit um, continues to weaken. Let me just put this, bring this out a year. Yeah, the support's down around 450 to 475. So I would not expect that this is going to reverse until we get down to test this area. So we had a pretty big important low back in April and you can see a couple of lows or close lows around 475 back in late February, early March. And we also got down close again in early May. Uh, after breaking these recent lows at five and a quarter I, and we're going straight down, I suspect we're gonna move back into this zone, probably all the way back down to 450 to test that April low. It's not one that's been performing very well on a relative basis, I'd pass. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, mm, uh, chart, let's see, yes, GTLS, chart industries. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, it's breaking down short term below some recent uh, support. And I would have, uh, I think this may have been one of my setups from a couple of weeks ago, it really did well off of the uh, support area. That's not the line I want. Uh, the, all these pullbacks in the prior high right in here, you can see was at about 72 and a half, 73. And so I, I remember putting this one out right about this level, um, maybe two weeks ago. And then con considering the recent highs up here as your trading range and target. So we went right up there, tested it, failed to break out, came back down and now we're breaking below, which now I think suggest we could be heading back into this support area. So I'm gonna get rid of these other support lines just so it's not uh, too crazy, too many lines on the chart. But here is where I'd be looking. I think uh, now that we're breaking down in the near term, I think we have a good chance to go back, fill this gap to maybe 68 or 70 right in this area. And that's where I'd look for another reversal. All right. Uh, this broadline retailer is having a particularly bad day. Costco. Cost is the symbol, of course. Yeah, they reported earnings that beat top line. They beat bottom line. But they did announce that they had a material weakness in internal control uh, that had centered around their user access and financial reporting. I'm not really sure exactly uh, what that was referring to. But I would be careful here because it does look to me like we have maybe what I would refer as a character change off of an uptrend. We're now downtrending below that 50 day moving average. Volume is very heavy. We're going negative on the PPO. Short term, I'd be a little cautious here. Okay. Uh, the next one, uh, how about Apple? Lots of big names today. Yeah, Apple's been a great performer and uh, definitely getting hit like many of the others, but on a relative basis, it's holding up pretty well. The recent buying took place at 215 on some decent volume. I suspect if we get down to this level, we will see buyers step back in again. So I think it's got a little bit of downside action, but on a relative basis, it is a, a very good performer. So got to continue to like Apple. All right. And our final one, uh, our only industrial in the defense industry, FLIR Systems, F L I R. Okay, um, negative divergence at the top with some decreasing volume. So that's a little bit of a concern, um, but it is playing out with this recent selling. But as, you, as we're moving up, you can see the PPO is kind of flat, but on that last high, false breakout too. Never like to see that. Um, but it's almost like with the PPO, it's telling us that price momentum is slowing. And then uh, we get that false breakout, which kind of confirms it. And on this move to the upside, you can see the volume down in here on that attempted breakout was very light. So we're seeing slowing momentum in terms of price action, but also in my opinion, in terms of volume. So now the question is, where does this stock fall back to? After the big move up in late July, it pulled back and held around 57 and a half. That's an area I would look to as support. If you fail there, you got a double top breakout around 55 and a half. So those are the couple levels I'd look for on weakness. I think right now with the PPO going negative and breaking below the 50 day, Looks like the stock has a little bit more downside here in the near term. Okay, and that completes the 10 and 10. Here are the symbols that we went through. You'll find all of these charts in the Market Watchers Live chart list. To get to that, just go to the Blogs tab and go to the Market Watchers Live blog page, and you'll find the link right there at the top. All right, time for our final market update. Let's see what's been going on. 
interesting look today. So it is a difficult day. We are seeing a follow through really from the decline that we saw start on Wednesday, still heading lower. Currently the Dow is down 286 points, just a little bit more. Uh, the S&P down 29.5 points. Uh, NASDAQ continuing its uh, move to the downside, still setting intraday lows. The S&P 100 still setting intraday lows as well as the S&P 400. But we are seeing a little bit of a slowdown or deceleration of the decline on the Russell 2000. So that's a, a little bit interesting here to see them maybe starting to uh, pause and we'll have to see if, it, if uh, small caps can turn it around. Uh, but with this um, move and wave to the downside for all of these major indexes, I, I don't think we're going to see much out of the Russell 2000 today anyway. Uh, the Canadian markets, TSX, is lower, also setting new intraday lows. Treasury yields are up. Uh, currently reading 3.231%. Uh, this is one of the things that I've been talking about is how gold and uh, the dollar have been decoupling. I think this is a great example. Although we started the morning with a big gap down for UUP and a big gap up for gold, notice gold has stayed completely in positive territory. The Meanwhile, the dollar started to gain some entrance back into positive territory. It is on the upside, barely by 0.01%, uh, but it is still in positive territory. And yes, the gold pulled back, but it is still on the positive side. So you can see a little bit of decoupling there between the two. Uh, I think that gives gold a little bit of an opportunity to start making a move to the upside, despite the dollar starting to break out. TLT bonds gap down, uh, moving slowly, uh, and further lower, currently reading 113 and six cents. USO is up, but has been mainly consolidating sideways for most of the day. It is up four cents, currently reading 1578. Uh, and that concludes the final market update. I'm going to pass it back to you, Tom, and get ready for that sentiment report. Okay, yeah, transportation stocks I just wanted to mention because off of the negative divergence, higher prices, lower PPO. I would have expected a 50-day test. That's what I look for instead of the 20 holding. I expect after we see negative divergences to go down to the 50. And sometimes we do go below. Um, but I think that at this point now, the PPO is reset. While this is a short-term negative, losing the 50-day moving average, I do just want to point out that when we look at the uh, weekly chart on the transports, um, you know, I look at the same principles. we got a rising PPO here. We don't have a negative divergence. Some might look at this and say, yes, we do. I don't look at that at all. I think that once we have gone back down to this 50-week moving average and gone back down near the center line, to me, that's where the negative divergence ends. And so now we've got strength in price, strength in the PPO, and that normally means a rising 20-week moving average that holds. So, yes, the daily chart's breaking down. Weekly chart, I would be watching this rising 20-week moving average, which is at 11,073 right now. Right back to you, Aaron, for sentiment. All right, let's get this started. And I do have some inf interesting information to share and show. Uh, actually, let me fix this. I don't want to do that. There we go. I want to have my arrow. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, today's decision point sentiment update. This is... Uh, an interesting report, I think, this week. I do want to remind everybody before I even start looking at these charts uh, that I'm going to show that sentiment is contrarian. It's a contrarian indicator, which means that when we see bullish readings in sentiment that's actually bearish for the market, the idea being if everybody is very bullish, uh, you're usually going to see that uh, reversal occur. So that's really what we look for is to see, uh, you know, whether investors, uh, the ma investment managers, you know, where they fall on that list. And then the right X ratio is going to show us where the actual money is going. And then I'm going to show you uh, the VIX and we'll look at uh, gold sentiment. All right. So the first one is our put call ratio chart. And as you can see at this point, we had the top and we are starting to head lower as far as the CBOE and equity put call ratio. But what I found interesting when I looked at 
this was the fact that we now are seeing a move really down into quite oversold territory for the OEX put call ratio. Now, usually it does not travel in the same direction as the CBOE and equity put call ratio. And honestly, I could invert the scale back here sometimes because uh, it is used more as a hedge, I guess is what someone had told me. So you do sometimes get different readings. But what I wanted to note, like I said, is we're now in territory we haven't seen for quite some time. And typically when you have readings, uh, which I consider oversold, you're gonna look for the, the rise. And you can see that we really have seen a uh, similar uh, information from the previous uh, very deep uh, de declines in that particular indicator. And they usually are going to follow up with a little bit of upside movement. And, you know, it's not a for sure. Obviously, you can see that it doesn't always uh, hold true. But the main thing I wanted to point out was the fact that we do have this very low reading. And when you look at what's happened uh, when we had those really deep uh, oversold readings that they typically have turned out okay. So uh, I would look at it as uh, somewhat bullish for the market at this point. We are starting to see these move lower. That does suggest, you know, that we're getting more uh, uh, bearish at this point as far as the put call ratio is concerned, but we're still really in a mediocre uh, middle of the road area for reading. So I'm not really seeing too much as far as that overbought, oversold when I look at those two. Next one I have is the AAII, American Association of Individual Investors. This is uh, a poll that you can take at aai.org and Basically, people go there and they click whether they're a bull or a bear or if they are neutral. And so this is the compilation. We get these on Thursday night and input them. Right now, what I wanted to point out is we have been seeing an increase in the bulls. And now we are hitting a reading that we have not seen since, well, let's look back here, since earlier in 2018, as far as the bullishness of participants right now in the market. And look at the deep uh, decline in bearishness. So you, this causes our ratio to get up uh, toward that two reading, 2.0 reading. Uh, we're not quite there, but generally when you get into that territory, uh, that means you've got too many bulls and you should start looking for a uh, reversal, market reversal to the downside. So when I look at these uh, individual readings, I would say that they are reading bearish for us right now as far as the market. Next up is the Name Exposure Index, National Association of Active Investment Managers. And we did see a pullback, a little bit of a pullback in exposure. But overall, when you look at what, where this reading is, and I, I drew the horizontal through here, so you could see how many readings are usually below the level that we are uh, looking at. Uh, we've had times where, of course, the exposure has moved above where we're at right now. But typically, uh, when you get these high exposure readings, you're going to see some downside movement. A lot of times uh, I've seen uh, some hesitation or, or we, we get them to, you know, we see these money managers increase their exposure. And then we sometimes we'll see a little bit of follow through on that to the upside. But in general, you should start looking for uh, neutral to bearish um, activity. All right. The next one I have is the Ridex ratio chart. And this is the one where I was saying that it's money where your mouth is. This is where we track the money flows. And that's what I really like. I, the surveys are great. Obviously, I use them uh, to help with my sentiment readings. But the best chart I would say is this chart because it shows us where actual money is going. Uh, we follow a group of funds that are managed by Guggenheim and the basket of funds has bear funds. Money market assets are given to us, uh, reported at the end of the day. And then we also have the Ridex uh, bull and sector funds. So these are the bull funds. And so what we do is we watch to see when assets start to rise in the bear and bull funds, as well as money market. 
And then we compare those into a RIDEX ratio is what we call it. And so you'll have the bear and money market assets over the bull assets, the bear bull ratio here. So I have uh, inverted the scale just because it works better uh, to show oversold and uh, overbought readings. And you can see we are, we've had some oversold readings. And so now we start to look for some uh, upside activity on the way. Obviously, when you look at this chart, we've had some difficult times here. But what's interesting is look at when we had this decline, what was happening to the bear funds? We, they were losing, um, they, were, they were starting to lose assets. So a lot of people were not in those bear funds during that time and they were actually pulling out of those bear funds and money was uh, rotating mostly into these money markets but you can see right now we did get that decline and we're seeing mostly a, a neutral reading as far as money market assets and then a somewhat neutral reading on the bull assets now i follow this week to week so i'm going to direct you to the thumbnail so so you can see that as far as the uh, bull funds go, we had a huge drop to begin the week, but we've been moving mostly sideways. So uh, my, I suspect the nerves were starting to hit because you got a little bit of an upside move on those bear funds at that point. But overall, when you look at where we're at now, we see a decrease in the bear funds. We see uh, mostly even uh, for money market funds, you can see where it started and where it is now, uh, and and a mostly a d decrease in the bull funds as well, which is interesting. You would think that when you start losing the assets out of the bear funds, you'd get an increase, uh, a move into those bull funds, but we're not really seeing that. In fact, there was a decrease. So to me, that that tells me uh, there's a, a, a an excess of bearishness as far as where the money goes. And what does that mean for the market? That's bullish for the market. So mixed readings so far. I wanted to show you the VIX chart. Uh, I invert my scale for the VIX. Uh, we talked about this earlier, Tom did. I'm like, well, hopefully he won't steal my thunder, but he didn't. <laughs> he pointed out the fact when you get these very high readings, a lot of times that's where you can get a uh, rally to to come out of. Uh, but the question is, when are people going to pull back that fear? Uh, when are we going to see the VIX start to pull back? What I look for, and I think is pretty accurate, is I use the Bollinger Band around the VIX. And when I get those punctures of the upper and lower Bollinger Band, that's when I start looking for that uh, turn to that turn. Now, sometimes, as you can see back here in July, we had, or J the end of June, uh, you had all of these punctures. So it wasn't an immediate move to the upside. We kept seeing the, the Bollinger Band punctured uh, to the downside here. But eventually, when it's popped back up above, that's when we started to see that rally begin. So I'm watching for these punctures right now. We had a puncture. You can see yesterday we had a puncture, but the VIX did close above that Bollinger Band. And now we're seeing another puncture, but we can see right now there's a very good chance we're gonna get a close below that Bollinger Band. And so I would start looking for a, a turn in the very short term, uh, meaning I think we're gonna see some upside next week based on the VIX numbers, if we close the VIX below that Bollinger Band. If we don't close it above the, uh, uh, if we close above that Bollinger Band, uh, it might take another day or two before we get things going because it may, we may need to see a few more readings uh, that are below that Bollinger Band as far as the intraday uh, highs. Because remember, this is an inverted scale. All right, the next one I wanted to look at was uh, gold sentiment. And what we do is we follow uh, what happens to gold uh, based on the premium and discounts from the physical gold trust. Uh, you can look up more about how that works uh, in chart school because that is in there. But when we see the high, high discount rates here, that tells us that people are very bearish. I think it's really interesting that 
as of July and all the way here into October, we're seeing a rise of discounts and it just hasn't done anything for gold. But we're finally starting to, if you want to look at it, consolidate somewhat. We've found a low, at least here on the Spot, Spot Physical Gold Trust. Uh, we found that low and now we're starting to head back up. Uh, this might be the end of the consolidation. It might be time for uh, gold to start making a move back up to the to the uh, upside there. So what do we have as far as our summary goes? Uh, put call ratio, we had that spike in oversold territory and that's bullish, I would say, for the market. Uh, AAII shows excessive bullishness, which means that's bearish for the market. Uh, name, we saw an increase uh, in exposure or a slight pullback in exposure, but it is still elevated. I would say this is somewhat bearish for the market. Uh, so we have uh, bull, bear, bear, if you want to keep score here. And right X ratio uh, is bearish for the market. So now we have, uh, I think that's three for the bears and one for the bulls. And then uh, breadth, as far as the VIX goes, I am seeing that as bullish for the market because we got that Bollinger Band break. Uh, and then to finish it, gold sentiment is still highly bearish. It hasn't helped, but I think we are still poised for gold to break out. We are seeing that decoupling from the dollar, so it's not gonna be quite as dependent. And if the dollar rises, it should still be able to rise if it has decoupled uh, from, from uh, the dollar. All right, and uh, that completes the decision point sentiment update. Let's take a look at what everybody else is thinking, and I'd love to know what you're thinking, Tom. Uh, I voted for lower next week. I do think we're going to see that spike on the, you know, based on the VIX, we'll get some upside uh, to start off the week. Uh, but I'm thinking by the end of the week, we're going to be lower. I think we're still uh, in a, a place where we just don't have enough bullishness out there in sentiment. Okay. Um, I am going to, wow, this is a tough one. Cause again, it is. well, when the volatility gets up like this, I, I don't take any chances. I mean, I kind of step to the sideline. If I get stopped out, I get stopped out and I just watch mm -hmm. because uh, the market, when it sells off, um, you know, takes no prisoners. And when you get the volatility rising, like it is right now, I mean, it's hard to say whether this is going to last one more day two more days, three more days or what, but mm -hmm. when selling occurs, it does uh, tend to, to sell off pretty fast. So I'm looking for a reversal. I think the market will tell us when it's time to get back in. Trying to predict what the heck is gonna happen next week, especially with the volatility rising is hard. Mm -hmm. I would just say that I do expect that we're gonna have a very volatile week next week. I think it's we could see some pretty significant moves in both directions, um, but if I have to pick one, I will say that we're going to end higher. I think that the, I actually think the opposite. I think that the beginning of the week could be very sketchy, especially if we close week today. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do think by later next week, I think once we hit a bottom on the VIX, I think the market will rally back and I think it'll rally back strongly. I just don't know when that's going to be. Uh, so right. I'm going to go higher for next week. Yeah, I guess I could caveat my um what I was saying, because if the VIX does global close um, below that Bollinger Band on my inverted scale, I would definitely look for upside uh, going into the week. But if it does close above that uh, Bollinger Band and it stays within uh, the VIX, I would definitely be looking for uh, some more uh, downside because I think it does need to close below that Bollinger Band. Got it. All right. Well, there you have it for uh, next week, the schedule next week. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. And a special thanks to Mary Ellen McGonigal for joining us for what, What's Hot, What's Not. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. We do love to get your feedback. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Friday afternoon, everybody. Hopefully we will see you back here on Monday. Be safe. Happy trading.